In this special edition of Video Fashion News, we look back at the visionary minds who defined fashion in the 2010s. Donatella Versace proved she is an unstoppable fashion force, carrying her brother's legacy into the new millennium. I think she's an 18-year-old girl in her heart for her whole life, so I, she's always young, she's always feisty. Stella McCartney was a pioneer of eco-chic and inspired the industry to make changes by decade's end. Jeremy Scott's journey to the runway was hard earned. I was born with nothing, dirt poor on a farm. If my story can inspire one person, then I'm really thrilled about that. Mucha Prada's quiet influence continues to inspire. Christopher Bailey rose to fashion fame in the 2010s and reinvented the House of Burberry. This has all been a big fluke because I, um, I never really had the dream to be a fashion designer. After half a century in the business, Ralph Lauren still defines quintessential American style. Plus, Karl Lagerfeld's enduring legacy. Karl has been so incredibly brilliant over the years at really defining that brand every season and making it new and fresh. But first, step back in time with Marc Jacobs. I don't think of the world as being this, that, or the other thing. It's like just one world. And um, so, and, and I can't help but be influenced by the places that I lived and the things that I know. Marc Jacobs, king of all that is downtown cool, has survived a lion's share of ups and downs in the fashion business and has managed to consistently land on his feet. In 1984, Jacobs was plucked from New York City's Parsons School of Design by Robert Duffy to start his own line. I remember sitting in the audience just so bored and all of a sudden these three sweaters came out and they were just so well done and so funny. It was purely original and there was humor in it, but there was also this integrity and a quality that I knew somebody put thought into it. Mark was hired by the all-American brand Perry Ellis in 1985. But after several years there, he was fired for his infamous but critically acclaimed grunge collection for spring-summer 1993. Even though the grunge collection was a commercial disaster for Mark Jacobs, it did inspire a whole idea about dressing and a kind of a, a more youthful approach to fashion at every level of the market and for every customer. A highlight of Mark's career came when the French house of Louis Vuitton appointed him as artistic director in 1997, and he was successful in overseeing the house's first foray into clothing design. Then in 2001, as well as in 2007, his substance abuse issues made headlines. I don't regret anything I ever did in the past, but I lived pretty fast and I went out a lot and I drank a lot and did you know, other substances I shouldn't have been doing. Or, you know what, I shouldn't even say I shouldn't have been doing. It was what I needed to do or what I felt I had to do. He has been producing the fashion industry's most covetable creations, and as his long list of accomplishments grows, so does his adoring and oftentimes high-profile fan club. As Marc Jacobs enters the 21st century, he began to amass an unprecedented number of awards a direct reflection of the provocative designer's devotion to his craft and his constant need to question the status quo. Today, Marc Jacobs is a worldwide fashion phenomenon. I learned from my brother that you don't do things with passion and the same things you believe in. Filled with lavish parties, celebrity entourages, and miles of platinum blonde hair, the glamorous life of Donatella Versace epitomizes the daring, brazenly sexy brand built by her brother, Johnny Versace. Donatella was long Johnny's creative muse, in addition to designing his secondary line, Versus. Sadly, it was Johnny's tragic death in 1997 that catapulted Donatella to the helm of the entire Versace empire. The sister of my brother was alive, lost a job for me. <laughs> and I try to continue you know, the best way I can. The DNA of Versace has always been about this strong, bold, Amazonian, sexy, in-your-face woman. I mean, I think Gianni did it in an incredible way, and Donatella just continues that tradition. Donatella's done an incredible job of keeping that brand interesting and exciting and, and, and relevant. Certainly much more of a, 
um, a feminine element because it's a woman who's designing it. A lot of people see my sweet size, but I like my sexy size better. Sexy clothes, that's what I like, I believe. Drawing from Johnny's signature sex appeal and dramatic flair, Donatella has perfected the unabashedly seductive, show-stopping red carpet gown. Versace continues to be a go-to label for A-listers looking to raise hemlines and make headlines. So it's sort of a nice combination of feeling quite sexy and on the other hand being quite contained. Versace represents the ultimate glamour. I mean, it's just glamour to the fullest. It's luxury. Two decades after taking the reins at Versace, Donatella continues to propel the brand into the 21st century, enticing the next generation of Versace customers with her alluring designs and eternally youthful sensibility. Somebody asked me to describe uh, Donatella and I always say she's like really fun, really fearless, really female. And I would say this is like the best definition of a collection. I love that Donatella goes to her rock and roll roots every time and it's and she finds new ways to express it. Nothing like a little Medusa and a little SNM to shake things up. Oh, I, Donatella, I think she's an 18-year-old girl in her heart for the, her whole life. So I, she's always young, she's always feisty. If anybody can pull it off, it's Donatella. The tweed suit, the quilted bag, the little black dress multiple strands of pearls, the camellia. These high fashion status symbols are the instantly recognizable and treasured signatures of the French house of Chanel. The house that Gabrielle Coco Chanel began in 1909 freed women from corsets and encouraged them to wear trousers. Chanel quickly became the definition of chic and grew to represent the ultimate in luxury. After Coco Chanel's death in 1971, the label lost some of its momentum until Karl Lagerfeld took the reins in 1983 and changed the course of fashion history. When I took it over, it was before the days of everything could be revived. Then people that don't touch it, that will not work. But I knew it could work because there was a power and a possibility and a number of elements and the idea of the modernity, what maybe was not the most modern thing in the middle 60s, 70s, but what I could turn back into fashion later. And I felt that because the people who own it and the people who run it had the right spirit and were open-minded and ready for that. Until his death in 2019, Lagerfeld produced endless innovative variations on Chanel's iconic signatures, continuing as Coco herself did to hold up a mirror to modern time. In a way, the Chanel jacket today, a real one or a fake one, is like a t-shirt or jeans or a pair of sneakers. It's really a basic fashion item. And I mean, there are very few, huh? so I think that's extremely flattering. And what I like best about Chanel today is, and what I think is the most flattering achievement in a way, that girls who are 15 wear it, and women who are their grandmothers wear it too. There's always this classic Chanel house, but it's just delivered with such spark. It was what makes all those cool young girls want to wear it. You know, I mean, it always gives it a, a very fresh language. He takes a lot of the signatures of the camellia, the pearl, the boucle suit and kind of is able to reinvent them a thousand times. You know, you have to update things for the times we are living in, so that's not changing. That is a, a healthy evolution, if not it's dead. Carl has been so incredibly brilliant over the years at really defining that brand every season and making it new and fresh. I think what's interesting is to show that a fashion label can exist for 100 years and stay trendy. It means there is something what can go with the idea of the modern woman of every decade. It's always expect the unexpected at Chanel and they, they, they turn the Grand Palais into more than an exhibition space. They, they turn it into high drama and theater. The great thing is the clothes never are diminished by the power of what they create on the set. You know, fashion is the uh, spirit of time expressed on the shortest deadline. Hmm? She might be one of the most powerful women in the United Kingdom these days. 
with a fashion brand that was named most searched for on the internet in 2012. But when she was a young designer, with the burden and benefit of a famous name, Stella McCartney's start in business was inauspicious. It was me in a garage with two friends, you know, in a sort of in a, a flat in, in London. And um, it was really taking off and I just didn't have the manpower to, to, to deal with it. So I got offered a couple of jobs and I took the Chloe one. Taking over the reins of Chloe from designer Karl Lagerfeld would have been overwhelming for most any designer. But for 25-year-old Stella, ignorance was bliss. I was very naive. I didn't think anyone would notice because I was so not in the industry. I didn't know about when um, openings came up in houses for designers that it was sort of of interest to people. It all worked out well though. You know, it sort of was the right thing to do because obviously Chloe was amazing for me. I loved every moment there. And, I learned so much and it also gave me the opportunity to get, you know, a partner like Gucci and it gave me the exposure to, to be where I am today. In 2001, Tom Ford and Domenico De Sole of the Gucci Group offered Stella the chance to return to designing a line under her own name. She'd done a really super job at Chloe and Tom came to me and said that she was, knew her quite well and thought that she had a great talent that could be a great acquisition for the group and so that's the reason that uh, we acquired the brand. It was a fabulous time that when um, Gucci approached me to start my own brand because other people were also approaching me and it was such a kind of like wow everyone's fighting over me and it's very much like will have a no will have and it was great I loved you know every minute of it but I went with the people that I felt were right for my brand. And over the years, the glamorous young businesswoman and her chic brand have continued to develop. She has a very loyal band of women who really think her clothes speak to their lives in the way they speak to her life. I am one of the few women fronting a, a house as in, in a women's wear world. I think that so many of her customers totally can relate to her image. What is impressive about her is that she always has had a very clear vision of what she stands for in terms of tailoring mixed with these kind of girly vintage inspired pieces and she has stuck to it no matter what everyone else said and when people complained about it being too commercial or not dramatic enough for the runway she doesn't let it bother her and you can see that it, it's worked for her. I feel like the longer she's in it the easier she makes it look. Her business is growing really, really steadily, and she seems to have found her own voice. We're working on loads of things. We've got our lingerie, our Adidas collaboration that we do, um, the new collection, obviously. We have eyewear, we have shoes and bags and everything. We're like, we're a big brand all of a sudden. We've grown up. I feel very sort of happy, you know. Right now we're in a really great place with everything. Having dreamt of becoming a designer since childhood, in 1997, Kansas City, Missouri native Jeremy Scott went from being a farm boy to a fashion provocateur with the launch of his eponymous label. The unapologetic Scott courted controversy with his brash wit, challenging the industry's notion of dressing. It's completely ludicrous, so you might as well have fun with it. As his great patron, Isabella Blow, said to me, you know, this is the avant-garde. And remember, everyone hated Alexander McQueen in his first shows. Looking for an appropriate environment, Scott established his career in Paris and presented his collections there for over a decade. The French have always treated me as their own since the beginning, even though I am American, but I came here on my own and started from scratch here. It was his use of Americana, as well as his cartoon interpretation of pop culture, that brought him notoriety and caused some to consider Scott the Jeff Koons of fashion. I think that's me as an American is part of my take on, you know, avant-garde fashion, and that's what sets me apart from other avant-garde designers because of that's where I come from. I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up on a farm. You know, obviously I wore denim and cotton and fleece and jumpsuit, you know, like sweatpants, everything. So it's only natural for me to take that and then take my high fashion kind of ideas and these kind of extreme artistic fantasies and meld them together. 
I just really like to try to talk about ideas and culture and what's going on and you know everything that's influencing me and touches me and just kind of put it out there for food for thought and so you know it's always kind of evolving and changing you know and you know it's like my generation and the kids out there and people that get it and tune into it are the people that really like it and wear it and you know support it. I love Jeremy Spies. I think his fashion is so fun and he makes clothes for people that want to make a statement and that don't give a what anyone else thinks. And this could be why he's dressed trend-setting stars from Nicki Minaj to Madonna. Even Karl Lagerfeld reportedly told the French newspaper Le Monde that Scott was the only designer who could follow him at Chanel. The reason why I do this is not to make this season's new skirt length or the perfect pant. That's not my job. That's not why I'm here. I'm here to offer up ideas, fantasies, to, to offer an alternative, to make people think, to create something new and kind of push things forward. In 2014, Scott's career was pushed forward when he was named creative director of Italian fashion house Moschino. The American in Milan has since catapulted the once withering brand back into the spotlight. Coveted See Now Buy Now capsule collections, larger than life runways, and major collaborations, including a 2018 collection with Fast Fashion Emporium, H&M, have made Moschino and Jeremy a favorite of millennials, further proof that the seemingly ageless designer is undoubtedly living the dream. I was born with nothing, dirt poor on a farm, no name of prestige, no silver spoon, no connections, no reason to be here today. If my story can inspire one person, then I'm really thrilled about that. Oh, I love Prada. Yes, let's talk about Prada. In 1978, Miyucha Prada inherited the family's leather goods business from her mother and quickly expanded the company into one of the most talked about clothing and accessories lines in Italy. What Miyucha has always done is really sort of take the absolute classic item of clothing in your wardrobe and reinvent it in the most modern, directional, futuristic, functional way. I loved the way she always takes risks on the runway. I think virtually every season, she comes up with something very unexpected and jarring. I would say that Prada is really what I am. The philosophy is the same. I think that is uh, your person, is your feeling, is your culture, is your way of having memories and remembers and uh, uh, desire of the being different. But it has to be something that really comes from inside. So this is what I think about. It's not from outside, it's really from inside. It's more inside collection than a design collection. <laughs> Prada is always ahead of the times, and her individual style is often translated into trends by her contemporaries. In 1992, Prada branched out with a successful secondary line, Miu Miu, followed by Prada Sport, a menswear line, and a lingerie line. Miucha's influence on the fashion world is so great she has twice received the International Award from the Council of Fashion Designers of America. Muccia always leads the pack. The minute people catch up to her, she goes and does something else again, and she's always one step ahead. She doesn't care what everyone else is doing, and everyone will continue to follow her. Muccia really thinks things through. She is making a point. She's not just making clothes. Despite a history that goes back over 150 years, at Burberry, the biggest headlines have happened in the last decade. For more than a century, the house was known for two things, durable trench coats and its signature plaid. However, in 1997, CEO Rosemary Bravo hired Roberto Menichetti to bring a fashion edge to the label. In 2001, she upped the ante even further when she replaced him with young Brit, Christopher Bailey. This has all been a big fluke because I um, I never really had the dream to be a fashion designer. You know, it wasn't really on my radar. I'm a believer in when things happen, they happen for a reason and they, they will happen naturally. I, I, I don't really kind of push something. I'm, I'm fairly laid back in, in general. I certainly never ever anticipated being a creative head of a big company such as Burberry. That was never ever 
even a dream in fact. As an MA student at London's Royal College of Art, Bailey was noticed by Donna Karen, where he became the women's wear designer for three years. He then went on to spend five years by Tom Ford's side at Gucci, where he was noticed and poached by Burberry in 2001. He has such a passion for everything British, and we just thought it would be just terrific. We always admired his tailoring. We always loved what he was doing uh, in, in his other companies that he worked with. And so we just thought it was, uh, would be a very good match. Bailey climbed the creative ladder from design director to chief executive and chief creative officer. His design and leadership talents paired with his enthusiastic embrace of social media propelled the storied Burberry label into a 21st century global power brand. Bailey would leave Burberry in 2018 after cementing his name in the fashion history books. The show is live streamed all around the world. You know, we, we did a, a Twitter uh, show uh, for, the, for the first time. There's so much love uh, gets put into those pieces, but it doesn't mean that you can't communicate them very, in a very quick way to all your different communities around the world. For 50 years, Ralph Lauren has been creating a name that is synonymous with American elegance and classic tailoring. It's about not the kind of clothes that you only wear once in your life. It's about clothes that you live in and enjoy, that become your favorites, and that you have them in your closet and you don't ever want to get rid of them. That's the kind of clothes that I design. Is the American dream. He started making ties and ends up with an empire. Ralph Lauren has really truly personified what's possible in America. He's kind of created an American dream through his clothing and through his all of his designs for home and a whole lifestyle. Uh, he's short. He's very short. You're short. And short people, it's tough for us to find, you know, I can wear his suit. I don't know, but you know what I mean. So are you wearing Yes, yes, and I didn't have to shorten it. He has shaped the way people dress as well as the way they live. Whether it's the polo grounds of the Hamptons or the sandy trails of Santa Fe, Lauren's true talent lies not only in seeing a niche and filling it, but also in crafting a desire for a lifestyle and selling the wardrobe to match. Ralph Lauren is a master at branding. He created a world everybody wanted to go into. I started doing menswear, and then I started to do women's wear, and then I started to do children, and then I started to do home, and then I started to do sport, and then I opened stores. Lauren is also well known for his generosity of spirit, giving back in a charitable way. He's very generous. He does things for people who don't expect things done, and they're surprised, and they're always very touched. Just think about all that he's done to fight the tragedy of breast cancer. Ralph founded the Nina Hyde Center for Breast Cancer Research and Treatment at Georgetown University and the CFDA's Fashion Targets Breast Cancer Initiative. But that's not all. Ralph Lauren is a true humanitarian. I think a good designer is an individual. Uh, he doesn't want to look like anybody else. My job is not to look at what they're doing in Europe. What, what they're doing here. I've got to do what Ralph Lauren is.